Now, here are your hosts, Dominic Tavella and Michael Hartsman. All right, I'm Michael Hartsman. Today is Tuesday, March 7th, 2023. And I'm on, as always, with my partner, Dom Tavella. And Dom, I think we have to rename the show. Where in the Where in the world is Dominic Tavella? <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, we could let we can let our our guests and our our clients and listeners guess, right? They can send in, and if if they win, uh, they get a T-shirt or something with the label <laughs> logo on it. Yeah, uh, a mo- as always, Mike, a moving target. Uh, and yes, uh, today in a completely different location so <laughs> secret location i might add for, for, for those that just must know they can't sleep at night orlando florida tonight there you go well have fun in in, in orlando and um i guess so uh, hopefully you had a little bit more fun than the market t- did today you know jerome powell had a much anticipated they call it a testimony he's not being accused of anything but you know he, they, might, he might after today he, he might be after today but, you know, he gets up in front of Congress and he answers a bunch of questions and um, he was not uh, very giving today. You know, he was honest. He was truthful. And and the inflation winds have changed again, Dom. And, and the Fed clearly is ready to pivot and keep rates, you know, higher for longer. That seems pretty obvious at this point. Uh, yeah, so just like a minute of background, right? We actually had a decent week in the markets uh, last week after after four weeks in a row of declining markets overall uh, last week. And, it, and I think it was with an eye towards this week's testimony that the market started to soften up a little bit. Uh, the major indices were up an average of what, two and a half percent mm-hmm. week. It looked like everybody was taking a deep breath. The, hey, it looks like the Fed is getting ready to slow down on their interest rate hiking policy. And uh, there's uh, Lucy taking the football away from Charlie Brown, uh, Chairman Powell today, making it pretty clear that interest rates will be higher and for longer than obviously the markets anticipated. And we talk about this every week, it seems, but here's the frustrating slash contradictory point about all this. The reason that's the case is because the market's too, the economy is too strong, right? So it's almost as if, you know, they're trying to 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 break the back of the economy without completely paralyzing the economy. Well, and 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 we've brought this up on the show a few times, Mike. Is it is the Fed intentionally trying to put the economy into a recession? And I would argue, no, they're not intentionally trying to, but they are very intentionally trying to slow the economy down. And you do that by making mortgage rates higher. So it becomes more difficult for people to buy homes. It makes it more difficult for somebody to buy a car. It makes it more difficult for somebody to put something on their credit card because the interest rate on the credit card is going to be at a higher rate. So the Fed is very definitively trying to slow the economy down with the hopes of slowing down and making inflation finally roll over. You know, and these Fed chiefs, Dominic, are basically they're historians and they follow very closely past recessions and past economic cycles. And Jerome Powell has basically indicated that he doesn't want this to be the 1980s, where Alan Greenspan stopped, not Alan Greenspan, Paul Volcker, I apologize. Paul Volcker stopped and started the interest rate cycles. And then and then at a certain point, it just got out of control and we were with these. Yeah, so, so not rate. that, you know, we don't want to get into the wonkiness of it, but Volcker is deemed to have done this incorrectly by starting mm-hmm. and stopping. And Greenspan is deemed to have done it correctly by literally putting his foot down on inflation, wouldn't let up until it was finally over. So the, clearly the Fed is trying really hard not to do this start stop that you just mentioned, Mike. Um, But it still comes down to everything we've said from January 1st of this year that it's likely that inflation is stickier than maybe some people in the market uh, think. And uh, Fed will at least have to keep interest rates a little bit higher than the average uh, market analyst thinks. And so none of this really has really terribly shocked, I think, you and me. We've been talking about it all year. So let me try to... uh 
paint the glass half full rather than half empty. Is inflation stickier than anticipated or is the economy stronger than anticipated? And, you know, there is still some positive undercurrents if the economy stays strong, because maybe we don't have to have the wheels completely fall off. Yeah, Mike, I, I think you bring up a really good point in, in this. The, the unemployment employment scenario is we have lots of jobs in this country. And if there are layoffs, those people get jobs pretty quick. When you have a job, you're inclined to spend money, whether it's going out to dinner, whether it's buying the new car, the home improvements, that keeps the stimulus in the economy going. Um, and therefore, you know, are prices really going to come down? If people don't have money, then prices have to come down. But if people have money, they're going to spend it. Uh, and so it's kind of the Fed is caught between a rock and a hard place, Mike. Yeah. And where they're spending it, Dominic, and again, I know we've talked about this on past shows, there is still ex- they're spending it still on experiences. And I think that's part of the, the COVID drag. Um, they're spending it on travel. They're spending it on entertainment. You know, they're not necessarily spending it on on goods, right? Spending it on services. And and when when sales slow down in in companies, that that also will help bring inflation down as well. You could argue. And, and another part of that uh, point, Mike, is that, and again, we've, we've talked about this in the past, but, you know, the consumer is still pretty flush with cash, right? So, but but we are literally, we can track this. Their cash reserves are going lower and mm-hmm. lower and lower every single month. And we've talked about that credit card debt has literally exploded. So between the consumers that have money, their cash reserves are going lower the people that don't have as much money are using their credit cards to finance those purchases. This seems like it's going to come to a head about mid-year. And then you would think sales overall are going to come down pretty dramatically. And at that point, hey, if a company wants to sell this product, it's going to have to lower prices. Right. I agree. So let's switch gears for a minute. Let's pivot for a second and talk about the market. You know, everyone loves round numbers. And and we, we, we shatter the... Uh, 4,000 number on the S&P 500. It was a good psychological benchmark, I think. So as of tonight, with the market closing down, you know, several hundred points and NASDAQ, the S&P, I'm sorry, down 60. So we're now underwater for the year. We're now negative for the year. And we're now below 4,000 points on the S&P 500. And I think, while not surprising that happened, I think also, Dom, those are psychological pivot points, which might affect the trading over the next couple of days. So uh, to your point, Mike, the the Dow is negative again for the year. The S&P is slightly up for the year. Um, And 4,000 is a nice round number. But uh, again, I apologize for getting wonky. I love that word, Mike. I'm going to use it as often as I can. Hmm. Um, But somewhere around 39, 20, 39, 50 is the line in the sand. So... um, 4,000, we've gone below it before. The, uh, we're calling that the 200-day moving average. But in English, it means that we've we've touched that now a couple of times, and then we bounced off of it. And we just did mm-hmm. that about a week ago. Mm-hmm. And that, that's very positive for the market. But if we come back down to this lower level of the range for the S&P 500, and we bounce off of it, again, that's a positive signal. But if we break through it, that's a negative signal signal. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to find out in the next couple of days whether we bounce or we break through. If we break through, it's likely we go to a lower low. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. And I think the other thing weighing on the market a little bit, Dominic, is that the U.S. Treasury market, you know, this morning when I looked to buy some bonds, you could buy a one-year Treasury maturing in next February for over 5%. And and those short-term treasuries are normally also an indicator of interest rates continuing to go up or down. You're exactly right, Mike. So we, we sit here and talk about the Fed, and, and, and that's the glass half empty. The Fed's raising interest rates, and how does it affect the economy in a negative way? What we don't really spend a lot of time talking about is that these higher interest rates means whether you're buying a T-bill, you can get 5%. There are banks out there offering CDs at 5%. If you're a saver, if you are a retiree and you have your money invested in, in interest-bearing bonds, you are 
finally, finally getting paid a reasonable rate of return, reasonable interest on your money. That's a positive in all this is that investors and savers have gone decades now without earning interest, reasonable interest on their money. You know what? Um, they deserve it. They basically funded the recovery. Um, it's about time that savers actually got paid. Absolutely. And, and it also gives the stock market a little competition. And right? that's not a bad thing, Mike. I know we don't no. like to say that out loud. No. But it means that a company really has to earn money, maybe pay a dividend, justify its actual stock price. And that's the third leg of this stool, Mike, that earnings for the S&P have been coming down. Company earnings, profits have been coming down. They're not horrible, but they've been coming down and valuations have been coming down. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, they are. And, and again, all these things are all interconnected. And I think for the next couple of days or weeks, I think the market has to get used to the new reality because we and other economists and financial advisors and financial professionals were fairly confident around New Year's. We'll get two or three rate hikes. We'll be done with this in May. And then we could kind of get on with our lives. And Dom, I think that that's gone. Right. This yeah, is, uh, this Mike, is uh, I know we're running out of time, so I want to make this point quick. But we were planning on this scenario when we're looking at managing our client portfolios and looking where to allocate money and looking where to allocate risk. This is actually the scenario that we thought would happen, that inflation would stay higher and interest rates would be higher for longer. And, you know, for a while there, I felt uh, maybe we got this, I got this one wrong. Maybe mm -hmm. we weren't uh, looking at the tea leaves in the right way. And maybe inflation was going to be fine and the economy was going to be, remember the no landing discussion, right? The economy yeah, that was a quick one. Was gonna come down. Um, maybe Chairman Powell's obviously thrown cold water in that. Maybe we didn't get it wrong in our thought process. I don't think we did. I don't think we did. So look, we're going to shift gears. Our guest this evening is an author, Douglas Bauer. He's written several books. He just came out with a new book called The Beckoning World, which takes place in the early 1900s about a young couple um, and, their, and their story. And it involves baseball and it involves Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. So it, it, it got our attention for sure. So um, we will be right back with Douglas Bauer the author of The Beckoning com. Now, back to the Labenthal Report. All right, I'm Michael Hartzman, back with my partner, Dominic Tavella, and our guest this evening, Douglas Bauer, the author of the book, The Beckoning World, which I'm holding up right now. And, and Douglas, when we when we heard from our mutual friend, Lissa, and I, I saw a book with a picture of a of home plate, it certainly got mine and Dominic's attention. So tell us a little book, a little bit about the genesis of the book and what it's about and, and how is baseball incorporated? Sure. And thanks to you both for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, the genesis of the book actually was a piece I read in the New York Times uh, that talked about an actual barnstorming tour that Ruth and Gehrig took uh, across the country after the 1927 World Series. And they got on a train in New York and went all the way across the country to California, played in several little towns or relatively small towns along the way, exhibition games. And one of the games they played was in uh, Sioux City, Iowa. Um, and I grew up in nearby in a little town in Iowa and it caught my attention and the, just the thought that uh, these two gods would descend you know, out of nowhere off a train to this little town in the middle of, uh, of the country to play a, a baseball game. I just said to myself, there's a story there. Um, but the, this, the, the idea came from reading about this actual trip that took place on uh, Gehrig and Ruth's part as they moved east to west in the, the fall of 27. So you, you want to give us a quick rundown of what happened when they got off the train there? Doug? Well, um, I, I can tell you what happened in my imagination. I'm not sure what happened in fact. Uh, they did play a game, in fact. But in, in, in the story, in my novel, um, one of the, the, the main character, actually, of the story is uh, 
a, a young guy who's the pitcher for one of the teams that Ruth and Gehrig play in this exhibition. And uh, the young guy, his name is Earl, Earl Dunham. And he had a promising uh, baseball career himself, which was cut short for circumstances that really make up most of the story. But it's that, it's that fictional game that is played in the middle of the novel where Earl is a pitcher pitching to Babe Ruth, uh, who's on the other team in this exhibition game. And uh, certain things happen over in the course of the game. Um, and that leads to Earl and his young son, nine-year-old Henry, joining Ruth and Gehrig on the train to continue the trip across the country um, and just kind of have this, you know, just kind of uh, uh, amazing experience riding in a Pullman car with the two gods as they play across the country. Douglas, are, were there any other major leaguers when they did that barnstorming or did they just play local folks when they just got to local they folks, stopped? just okay. local folks? I mean, they, there was some, as I understand it anyway, there was some effort to uh, draw from semi-pro teams and, uh, you know, skilled amateurs. Uh, but Ruth and Gehrig were captains of the respective teams um, and everything else was drawn from from local players of, of course, you know, various talents, various uh, skills. But for the most part, I think pretty, pretty skilled. So, Doug, I know I know this particular story is fiction, but you did a lot of research in order to get you to where you could write this book. Right. And I I did indeed. And that I mean, that was a utter pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a complete baseball addict. So uh, to call it work is uh, a misnomer. But yeah, I read biographies of both Ruth and Gehrig. Um, as I said uh, earlier, I knew quite a bit about Ruth and his life, very little about Gehrig's. Um, and I also read uh, about the history of the time in general. One of the uh, one of the features of the book is, you know, it's set uh, in 1911 up through 19 almost 50. But one of the features of the book is the Spanish flu of 1918. That plays a really important role in the story. And I read a lot about that. So I just let my, you know, my natural inclinations for uh, following what interested me, just let it take me. So and, even even though the story is fiction, when you think about and all the material you read and you think about players today and how they travel and how they're <laughs> treated, you want to you want to draw a contrast a little bit between what you read and and and, th and that was nonfiction, right? That was the reality of, of the day. Um, how does it contrast to today? Well, I think, uh, you know, Ruth and Gehrig were treated pretty, pretty royally. They they rode in the, this very luxurious Pullman car, uh, attended by a steward, um, and so there's a kind of comparable level of luxury there, I would guess. Um, but for the likes of people like Earl, who played a little bit of minor league baseball in the, in in Class B, um, there's no comparison. I mean, there's, there, there's no no hint, no 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 sign of luxury in the way he was treated as a as a minor league player. He made one hundred and fifty eight dollars a month uh, uh -huh. as a as a Class B uh, pitcher. And and speaking of Babe Ruth, there's a very famous line of his. Um, I think one year he signed a contract for one hundred thousand dollars or eighty thousand dollars. And at the time, Herbert Hoover was the president and a reporter asked him, how does he feel making more money than the president of the United States? And Babe Ruth, without missing a beat, said, well, I had a better year. Yes, it's, I know that quote, and, and it's classic Ruth. And who could argue? Right? <laughs> exactly. And just one other follow up question about those two gentlemen. They were both completely different personalities. And I've always read. And I didn't do nearly the research you've done, obviously, but I've read that they didn't get along that well. Were you able to uncover any of that in your research? Well, the biographies sort of uh, allude to it. Um, I think in the time of my novel, my story, 
Um, it was early on in their relationship. It was really uh, Gehrig's first full year as a as a as a as a star as the as the starting first baseman. Mm -hmm. He was 24 years old, and Gary, uh, Ruth was 33. So one forgets there was almost a decade's difference in their age. And I think initially, um, Gehrig, who was just almost uh, uh, just tragically shy and awkward socially, was just in awe of Ruth and, and uh, wanted to do anything he could to please Ruth. But, you know, as Gehrig became more sort of certain of himself and as his stardom, it took hold and he became uh, a little more self-confident. Uh, various things, uh, various personal matters collided. And by the time that uh, uh, Gehrig was getting ill, uh, they had pretty much had a falling out. And uh, there was a bit of a rapprochement when Gehrig came back for his final appearance on, in Yankee Stadium, where he had his luckiest man speech. And Ruth came up to him afterwards. They were all on the field and even a big bear hug, uh, so so strong that it almost knocked Gehrig over, which that's how weak he was. Um, but you're so right that, uh, that that they they did they did have a falling out and never really uh, reun they never really repaired it. And uh, Ruth was uh, how do I say this politely? He enjoyed himself um, and maybe <laughs> even after hours a little bit more. Probably than Gary. Do you get into that at all in the story? Um, Their social I certainly do. interaction I certainly do. after uh, there, there the game. A handful of scenes that show uh, Ruth enjoying himself immensely in this in the in the novel. Um, I had some great advice when I was researching the book. I have a good friend here. I, I, I live in Boston, and uh, uh, his name is Lee Montville, and he actually is one of the people who wrote biographies of Ruth. Terrific biography called The Big Bam. And I was having lunch with him when I was first starting to research my story. And I said, you know, Lee, give me some advice how, uh, as to how to uh, create a fictional Babe Ruth. And Lee said, well, here, here's the thing you have to remember. Uh, he was the most hyperbolic human being who ever lived. And no matter uh, what you might think for him to do, he did it and more. So you can't possibly go over the top when you're <laughs> describing anything that you have might think of him to do over the course of the story. And that gave me such great permission, you know, and I, I took advantage of it. But as someone said, uh, you know, he was all appetite, uh, all he, he just, just looking for the next thing to consume. And whether it was food or drink or women or you name it, you know, he, he was insatiable. Over the, over the top. Over the top. So, 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 Douglas, the other star of the book, to some degree, is the 1918 Spanish flu. Right. And I know you started writing the book before the pandemic and before COVID. It's just a, uh, a coincidence and, and a fantastic timing. I don't think many people alive today, other than reading in, in a, a paragraph in a history book, spend any time thinking about the 1918 Spanish flu. Now we all know about it. So what was it about that pandemic, you know, that led you to incorporate some of the um, tribulations that your characters were going through? Um, I have had a, a kind of I, almost a ghoulish fascination with the, with the Spanish flu history um, long before uh, I started this novel, the research of the novel. Um, so for me, it was kind of a natural thing to want to include. Uh, and I'd, I, I had read a couple of marvelous novels that, uh, uh, that used the Spanish flu as an element. There's a beautiful William Maxwell novel uh, called They Came Like Swallows, which is a story of his, his mother, really, who died from it. And uh, a beautiful book of poems by uh, Ellen Bryant Voigt. So I was kind of a little bit immersed in it, in in, in the the, uh, the legend of the of the epidemic, and then um, I just began to almost do a a backward arithmetic because the, if the story starts in 1927, and I wanted certain things to happen earlier, 
I just began to count back and I got to 1918, 1919 and thought, ah, okay, I can use it. Done. Right. So when when you incorporated when you incorporated the, the, the Spanish flu, you already knew a lot a lot about it. Um were there a lot were, were there and you were writing the book when pan, when the pandemic started. Did you pivot at all with the with the pandemic in mind, or you just kind of stayed focused on the period you were writing about? No, I stayed focused, but you know, I didn't I really didn't need to pivot because within that focus, um everything I I, I sound kind of ruthless as a storyteller, I know, but everything I needed from the flu as an element in the story uh, was there for me without having to really manipulate it. I just needed to apply it mm -hmm. and to report it, really. Um, and I learned a lot about just, you know, how quickly and how violently people died from. It. And it just descended in the morning with a tickle in your throat and you were dead by night. And it's just an astonishing uh, kind of scourge. So when you were doing all this research and you're looking at basically the state of affairs of sports here in this country uh, in baseball, did it kind of make you uh, uh, wonder a little bit of the state today and, and where we are with the money and social media in particular, where, you know, Ruth got away with what he got away with, because even if a reporter saw it, they weren't gonna, they weren't going to talk about it. They weren't going to write about it. But today that that's really changed. Were, were you shocked at the contrast? Um, well, I certainly was impressed by the contrast. Uh, I, I sort of, you know, kind of implicitly understood it. But you, you make a great point. Um, but, you know, with Ruth could not have gotten away with what he got away with. Uh, there, first of all, there wasn't the opportunity to expose it. And secondly, there was just this agreement that, you know, there, it, wasn't Un unwritten be, rule. it wasn't to be exposed. Yeah, it was everybody's secret or wasn't even thought of as a secret, I don't think. It just, just for the record, it wasn't just the baseball players, politicians as well. Well, you, absolutely. You didn't write about it, right? You absolutely. Didn't, you didn't disclose it. Exactly so. Exactly. Douglas, we're bumping up against a break. Hopefully you could stick around because we, we do have some more questions for you. Happy. Happy to do it. Great. We will be right back after this break with uh, Doug Bowden. Now, back to the Labenthal Report. All right, I'm Michael Hartsman, back with my partner, Dominic Tavella, and our guest this evening, Doug Bauer, the author of the new book, The Beckoning World. Um, you know, Doug, we we appreciate your time and we appreciate us you us you giving us a background on your on your new book. But let's talk a little bit about the business side of this, because we are a financial show, and Dominic and I both have aspiring authors as clients, keyword being aspiring. Um what is that process like? I know you also teach at Bennington College, right? Right. And obviously you, you publish seven books. So you're a novelist. It's not a hobby for you. This is a profession, right? Indeed. So what is that? How difficult is it to balance, you know, teaching at Bennington College, making sure you fulfill those responsibilities, making the time to do your research and sitting down in front of the computer? Just walk us through and, what, and God what's forbid, it, actually have a social life. Exactly. You know, <laughs> what's it like the day in the life of Douglas Bauer when he's <laughs> knee deep in writing a new book? Well, it would probably be the, the most boring documentary I ever, ever written. <laughs> uh, I'm, you could just watch me sitting at my desk. Um, but you're so right in that uh, it, 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 it does require a real uh, effort to balance those, all those elements in your life, and particularly the ones that you mentioned, the teaching and the writing. And it's a very common combination for writers to, you know, when I uh, often, I used to say, uh, you have to, I had to find something to subsidize the habit and teaching was, was that. Um, but I, I very much enjoy teaching. And I, I think some of the problem that <clears throat> some writers face is they really teach reluctantly. And they're, they're, they're very jealous of the time away from the writing um, that teaching demands. I've never had that problem, although I will be quick to say, <laughs> I've certainly had uh, times when I was teaching more than I wanted to. 
and 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 in that case, uh, I did feel some of that uh, that dissatisfaction with the imbalance of writing and teaching. Um, but if you if you teach um, you know the thing you love, which is literature for me, um, that's hardly a penalty. That's 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 not punitive. And I've always enjoyed the classroom. Um, so it's 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 a stimulus of another sort. But the, the key is to try to find enough time uh, for yourself. And it, and it, you have to be selfish, finally. Um, fortunately, you know, my wife is a writer also. Mm -hmm. So she understands this, that she's dealing with the same issues that I am. So we uh, kind of give each other space. But... Uh, it's, it's simply that, I mean, uh, as you say, you know, the, the, the chances of being able to only write and be uh, financially secure just by your writing, it's a, it's a wonderful thing that happens, but it happens pretty rarely. And, and Doug, I know each book might be different, each author might be different, but how long did it take you to write this book between this starting one, the research and finishing the product? Yeah. Uh, from the time I started, and I, I don't mean to suggest I, I worked without interruption, but I started it six years ago. And um, I wrote other things in between. Uh, life intervened. Um, but the when I really began, when I first read that article in the New York Times that I was telling you both about that got me thinking about this book, that was about six years ago. So a follow-up question to that, is writer's block a thing or is that just a cliche we see in the movies? Um, fortunately, I've, if it is a thing, it's never visited me. Good. Although I've served, wow. I, I work very slowly. Very, I mean, as six years would, would testify to that. <laughs> but I do, I, I do work very slowly. I work steadily. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'm uh, uh, the turtle rather than the hare. Um, and I just uh, take my time and try to pay as much attention to the language as I can. Um, but I've certainly talked to writers who say they have been visited by writer's block. They're just unable to get anything down. Um, and that sounds like, you know, just the worst curse I could I could imagine. Um, so, yeah, I do think it's a real thing. Mm. I do. So, Doug, financially, you obviously had a real, I'll uh, use the term real job. You've published seven, seven books, so clearly you're, you're a real author. Um, but in, in the meantime, you're writing this book, you, you're doing it out of passion. You're not doing it as, oh, God, I'm going to have a best. I mean, you hope to have a bestseller, but it's not the money that's motivating you. No, 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 it isn't. Uh, um, and I don't mean to sound uh, precious about it, but um, I, I, I wouldn't be able to write I wouldn't be able to devote that much time and that much energy to something if I wasn't passionate, if I was doing it purely out of sort of mercenary instinct. Um, I, I was lucky too in that I began to write, the first, the first writing I ever did, was, I was a magazine journalist. And then I went off um, and was a freelance magazine journalist. So I spent about four or five years uh, in my late 20s and early 30s, making a living as, as, a, as, a, as a freelance and just kind of going from magazine piece to magazine piece. And it really kind of just in, ingrained the idea that this is a job and <laughs> you got to report for work every day. And if you don't, you know, you, the, the rent comes due. Um, and so I've, I've been very grateful that that was kind of my indoctrination to the whole relationship between writing and living um, is, is not, not to wait for the muse to visit you. Uh, if you. If you wait for that, you, you, you'll, you'll be uh, out on the streets, I think. Um, so I, I do try to think of it as a job, um, one I'm passionate about. So you're, you're a kid from a small town in Iowa, right? In the middle, middle of the country. Right. So was it your imagination that led you to writing like your imagination of what, you know, other cities would be like, or bigger metropolitan met metropolises would be like, what was the inspiration for you to even think I'm going to devote my life to being a writer? 
Well, it was very, very incremental and very, my, my, my steps were very timid. Um, I, you know, I always wrote as a kid in, in high school, my teachers encouraged me and but it never for a moment occurred to me that, that I would make a living as a writer. And, and uh, but I, I just always liked to write. Mm. But my first, uh, I was a journalism major as an undergraduate and my, my bachelor's degree is in business with journalism. And I worked in advertising and I wrote advertising copy. So my first quote writing job was as an advertising copywriter. Um, and I got more and more interested in the editorial side of magazines rather than the advertising side and uh, moved my way into becoming an editor and then a, a reporter. So the steps were not, not, not schemed. I mean, it was just kind of one thing led to another very slowly. You know, Doug, I, I want to come back to something you said because I, I wrote it down. I, I'm, I'm very impressed that the comment. Um, and we have clients that come in all the time and they, I love to bake or I love to cook and uh, maybe I want to start a business and make a business out of it, right? And they forget that it's a job. They yeah. forget you can have all the passion in the world, um, but at the end of the day, it's a business, right? Maybe, yeah. maybe uh, tell us what brought you to that focus, because that ultimately, I think, is what makes you successful, whatever, whatever your passion is. Yeah. Well, I, I do think, you know, I, I obviously uh, the, the imagination is, is kind of what drives it. But I do think uh, my personality is a, is a relatively practical one. And, uh, you know, I grew up the son of a grain farmer. So I, I, I watched what the idea of a job meant to him. And um, I told somebody once, speaking kind of metaphorically, that um, I think of myself as a writer as the way a farmer gets on the tractor at one end of the field and follows the furrow for two hours to the other end of the field. And if you don't have that patience and that sort of frame of mind and commitment settles into it and is, in, and, and is patient within it, um, that's for me, that's just kind of the, the ideal temperament for a writer. Um, and I mean, it's a very attractive definition of a job, but there's this notion of responsibility and, and just being attendant to everything that you need to be attended to. And uh, that just kind of, that's just kind of my temperament, I guess. And that's uh, nothing to applaud necessarily. It just, it just works in that sense. Doug, from a, from, look, I know getting a book published is very, very, very difficult. So as yep. a, and so by your seventh book, I'm sure you had a little runway and you had some confidence that if the book was halfway decent, you were going to get it published. But where what comes first? The, you know, the chicken or the egg? Does it, do you sit down writing with the with the hope that it's going to get published? I mean, at what point do you do you devote all this energy and then God forbid say you know, do I have to self-publish it? What, what if I can't find mm. someone to publish it? D does that ever creep into your mind along the process or are you just focused on the story? Um, I think I focus on the story while I'm writing the story. And, and I, I don't think so much about the end result, uh, except the end result being that I'll finish the story. <laughs> um, but, you know, as, as you get nearer to the end, uh, inevitably, those 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 considerations and those concerns uh, begin to creep in. Um, I'm lucky in that I have a wonderful literary agent um, who was you know is is very encouraging and is quick to tell me when he thinks uh, well, I'm going down the wrong path. So I have a little bit of a you know a, someone who helps steer me and keeps me um, relatively sane as I'm going through all this. Um, but it's increasingly difficult to publish. Uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, challenging time for, for, particularly for literary fiction. Um, you know, there's, there's, publishing is getting, I don't need to tell either of you, 
um, more and more conglomerate. There are fewer and fewer independent publishers that are willing to take a chance. Um, so the, the climate is, is ever, ever more sort of risky. I'll put it that way. Um, and, you know, I've, I've certainly uh, uh, had, I, I did write a book that did not get published some years ago. Um, and then I just kind of had to, you know, reorder things and do other things in the meantime until I came across this idea, the one that we're talking about today, the, the, the beckoning world. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's fraught. Yeah. Yeah. Just to kind of confirm what you just said, I have, I have a little, uh, tiny experience of via clients that are, have gotten some things published and are trying to get, it seems that the publishing houses these days have a very narrow scope of what they deem acceptable and, and marketable. Yep. Right, not yep. an, an, an original piece of nonfiction. Uh, if you if you're not somebody of your qualifications, I don't know how the average author even goes about getting something like that uh, published. Well, uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Don. Um, in in you know when I think of it in comparison to when all the years ago when I began um, in the late seventies, early eighties. It was a much more generous, much more in, inviting kind of environment. There were, I mean, just in terms of magazines, um, God, there were so many wonderful magazines you could work, write for um, that just don't even exist in it. And the, the fees that freelance writers get paid for magazine pieces today are pretty much what they got paid 30 years ago. It's, it's just... Uh, um, virtually impossible to, to, to make a go of it um, without a history. And I'm lucky I had that history that kind of helps me. And as I say, I've had great, great support from my agents and, and various editors along the way. But um, I'd hate to think that I was just stepping into it anew at this point. And Doug, you've been very polite. You didn't even talk about the people who call themselves bloggers and write whatever that comes to mind. And, you know, they throw it on the internet and they think they're writers. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, I don't think about that world at all. I really don't. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really not a social media person and, but you're right. I mean, and, and uh, they have a right to call themselves writers <laughs> at this point. It's kind they of the do. definition. And publishers look to bloggers to see, you know, what they can, who they can discover. Yeah, that's bloggers. that so, gem. Doug, just because uh, we're in the closing minute, um, I kind of saw Mike hold up an actual book with actual paper. Uh, <laughs> I was pretty impressed. And I have friends of mine that go, you don't still actually read books, do you? Um, so I thought I'd amuse you with, with that comment. Yeah, I actually still read books. I do. So you're the one. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so speaking of that, Doug, before we actually do run out of time, please tell our audience where they could get your book, where it's available and all that good stuff. Sure. Well, thanks for the app. Um, it's available on all the, uh, in all the usual suspect, uh, sites, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, bookshop.org. Um, my own website, douglasbauer.com, uh, you can order it there. So it's, it's, it's very easy to find. We appreciate that. So the name of the book is The Beckoning World, a novel by Douglas Bauer. And uh, your website is your first name and last name? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so Douglas Bauer, B-A-U-E-R. Dot com. And, dot com. and Douglas, we, we can't thank you enough. It was an interesting conversation and we appreciate your time this evening. Well, the Thank pleasure is all mine. Time, I really though. appreciate it. It was fun. Have Thank you. Time. We'll be right back right after this break. All right, I'm Michael Hartsman, back with a quick wrap up with Dominic Tavella. And Dom, I have to tell you something. I personally think three of the hardest things to do is to play a in musical instrument, write a song, and write a book. Yeah, I would only add hit a little, hit a little white ball. But uh, putting, putting that aside, yeah, it, it just seems like something that, oh, yeah, anybody can do it, right? And no, you can't. 
No, you can't. That is so hard. And that was kind of fun, Mike. I know maybe sometimes, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about the economy and the world and business and the stock market. Hearing how somebody struggled through and became a real author, that's kind of an interesting story in my world. It is. And 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 look, he, he, I know it's not easy, but he, he was so calming about it. He almost made it sound... You know, this is what I do, and this is it. Just I don't want to say it made it sound easy because I don't want to undersell the accomplishment. But he just he made it sound easy. I don't know what else to say. Well, what I think what he the way I took out of it, and I did bring it up to him, is that he made it a routine. He made it a job. Right. This is not something I'm going to write in my basement and and just kind of become the all time world's greatest author. It's, hey, I have to work at it every day. And maybe he didn't work at it every particular day, but he made it as a routine. He made it his job. Yeah, he was passionate about it, but I think that's really why this gentleman is successful. Yeah. And what I really liked his answer, Dominic, is he didn't write the book to make it a screenplay and to make a bajillion dollars in a movie. And if that happens, God bless. But yeah, we, we didn't act, I, I was thinking of asking him then, and then obviously with time as always gets away from us, but you would think this would be a terrific screenplay. They maybe a terrific movie. Yeah. He's, he, look, he's got a, he's got the Spanish flu, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig in the story. So traveling across the country and having a little fun at it. Ex exactly. So I, I, I appreciate, you know, him, him, he coming on and and shedding a, a different light, and and you and I both have clients who are aspiring actors and aspiring authors, and you know you write seven books, you're you're you've accomplished something. So I was I was happy to get his his input. And Mike, one last comment on that. You know, you write one um, and are successful. Great. They always say that second one is is really, really the hard one, right? And obviously, this is a gentleman that has seven published books. That's a big right. deal. Right. Look, you know, the, the how many times on the weekend on a radio do you, do they play the one hit wonders, right? The, there's a lot of one hit wonders. Yeah. Yeah. So listen, we're 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 running out of time. And just to getting back to what you and I do for a living. Um, I, I think the market, Dom, over the next couple of days and weeks, we're going to present a, a set of challenges. And I think, you know, the next couple of days will be telling, does the market absorb the reality, the new reality we're, we're in right now? Or does the market continue to throw a little bit of a tantrum, um, not getting what they want sooner? I think that's the big question right now. Big question, Mike. And we have one more uh, jobs number and then one more inflation number before the, and I think we can say confidently the next interest rate hike. Um, so those two numbers, data points are going to be pretty critical. Um, I think there's an adjustment in the market uh, coming back to the new reality that this is just going to take a little while longer than maybe the markets had anticipated. Yeah. And one thing we didn't mention, Dominic, you know, the old reality was maybe another quarter percentage point hike. And you have to seriously consider a half a point now is seriously back on the table. Yeah. A, a one quarter, Mike, and maybe, maybe, maybe and one more one quarter. Uh, yeah, it could be two in a row of half a percent. Um, but I stressing it to everybody listening to us and watching that the scenario that came out today is actually the scenario that we planned for. And that looked pretty dumb uh, maybe a month ago. Um, not so much today. Dominic, my friend, we're out of time. And um, I will see you down the road. I'll see you next week, I'm my sure friend. We'll catch up during the week and we'll be live again here next Tuesday. Safe travels wherever you are next. I'll have a surprise for you. <laughs> have a good night, everybody. Thank you all.